at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is quality of life, is mental health, is brain health. And I'll say that again, the only variable that's really in a primary outcome is your enjoyment of your life experience. And while all the other things matter too, you know, your dexterity, whether or not you have pain when you're walking, your strength on a certain exercise, your 5k time, these are all surrogates for the only thing that matters, which is your brain health. So if you're thinking about things that kind of get you directly to the outcome of interest, which is the ability to enjoy life, a reflection of your brain state, then you can start to think about what are the highest yield activities that are going to act directly on that system. And coming back to kind of what I said before about we don't think about mental health until things go wrong. Most people don't think about their brain health until things go wrong. and welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm Dr. Julie Fouché, family physician and former CrossFit Games athlete. Here, I bring you information and inspiration to help bridge the gap between fitness and medicine and support your journey toward your healthiest self. Thank you so much for joining me. Now let's get started with this week's episode. All right, welcome back to Pursuing Health. I'm excited to be here today with Dr. Austin Perlmutter, who is a board certified internal medicine physician. He's also a New York Times bestselling author. He's a published researcher and international educator. And his mission is to help people improve their health by targeting the biological basis of stuckness in our brains and bodies. So excited to talk to him more about what that means. His writing, presentations, podcasts, and online educational programs explore how environmental factors influence our cognitive and mental state and have reached millions. He currently serves as the executive director and research lead at Big Bold Health, a food as medicine company that's focused on helping people rejuvenate health through better immune function. And he's running some very interesting first of its kind research there as well. So welcome to the podcast today. It's great to have you, Austin. Great to be here. Well, I thought we could start off just with, you know, the general question that everyone probably asks, which is what led you to medicine and specifically to be so fascinated by how our brains work? Yeah, well, I I guess there's two things to know. The first is I had a lot of kind of uh, family background in medicine. My dad is a neurologist. His dad is a, or was a neurosurgeon. So there was kind of always a a predisposition towards medicine and mm-hmm. specifically brain related medicine. But then the other thing was that I only decided I wanted to go into health kind of late in the game. Uh, so I was a major in English in college, kind of took some pre-med courses because I thought they were interesting. And also I didn't know for sure whether being an author was a good long-term strategy. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not going to tell people I was always wanting to go to med school and all that. I kind of just <laughs> decided that was a good path forward because it was, uh, the best of the options I had, not because it was something I was always super passionate about, but wound up just loving the science of it. Um, I I always loved learning and there's a lot to learn in med school. So that worked Mm -hmm. out well. And then understanding how the human body works, um, coming out of med school, I had to decide what I wanted to specialize in. And I went to internal medicine because, if there's anything that's clear, it's that the biggest problems in health today are these chronic diseases and internal medicine focuses on chronic disease management, which Mm -hmm. doesn't sound all that exciting, to be honest. Chronic (laughs) disease management sounds... It's not uh, the most exciting term, I guess. It it isn't, (laughs) but but at least there was a perception I had where there was a, a clear delta, right? So there is a need, which is the majority of people living on earth today have at least one chronic disease. Most people will die of these chronic diseases and most of these chronic diseases are preventable. So mm-hmm. there was a clear opportunity to do something important in both understanding what was going wrong and providing solutions, which in theory should have solved this problem, which is people were heading downhill with these preventable conditions. I had the knowledge that I could give them to reverse or at least stop things from getting worse. Uh, but as many people probably know at this point, conventional medicine isn't really set up to, to do as much in the preventive side as I would have thought. And I was in it. Right. So, uh, Mm -hmm. if I could be kind of shocked at how little was actually applicable and in reversing people's unhealthy behaviors, then certainly I think most people would experience that same level of surprise. So that kind of took me through residency. That was 
why I decided to start there and some of, I guess, the basis for why I decided to go a different direction after I finished my training. I love that. And even the term chronic disease management itself is interesting, right? Because it implies we have to manage these diseases that they're not necessarily reversible or curable, which, you know, as we both know, they are, it's just not the norm in our conventional healthcare system and the way that things are set up. Yeah. So let me just talk about that for one second. You know, we live in a very amazing time in so many ways, what we have access to both the information and just the abundance of resources that are available today. And yet what we see is that people are dying earlier in the United States. There was just some research coming out showing that women die more likely in childbirth than they used to. Um, but maybe the most important thing is that we're not having more meaningful, longer, healthy lives. That just isn't happening despite everything that we're in theory doing to get closer to that. And kind of this speaks to a really fundamental point that I would want people to understand, which is that if you do the average thing in a world in which the average person is unhealthy, you will, on average, become an un unhealthy person yourself. You'll experience at least one chronic disease. You'll wind up on at least one chronic medication. And our medical system is set up, and I'm talking conventional medicine here in the United States, such that if something goes wrong acutely, if you have a heart attack, break a bone, or come down with appendicitis, it does an amazing job addressing that acute thing. But most of the acute issues are acute on chronic. And what I mean by that is, People have existing diseases, metabolic diseases, immune-related diseases, and eventually they get over that threshold where they were able to manage it. You know, they get a cold on top of their pre-existing COPD. Um, they have some additional stress on top of their pre-existing heart disease, and they wind up in the hospital. And all of our management is geared towards trying to find out what we can do to get rid of whatever tipped somebody over the edge, and then kind of just not stopping people from getting worse, but slowing the rate of decline of these diseases. Uh, everything is set up towards the inevitable understanding that there's not much that we can do to actually reverse or stop disease from progression, but rather there are a ton of things that we can do to make life more comfortable as disease gets worse and to reduce symptoms of those diseases. And while that is good in some ways, it in no way addresses the real crux of the matter, which is how do we prolong not just lifespan, but health span, quality of life over the longest period possible. Mm -hmm. That is so beautiful and resonates a lot, I think, with probably my listeners in the CrossFit community, because we talk a lot about one of the models of health in CrossFit is called the sickness, wellness, fitness continuum, where you know, we all fall somewhere along this continuum. And unfortunately, most people are somewhere around wellness or maybe somewhere between wellness and sickness just day to day with their chronic conditions. And that means that when you have an acute issue, like you said, maybe you get in a car accident, maybe you get a cold, maybe you have COVID, you have less resilience. And so it takes, you know, less to push you then towards that sick, that sick side of the continuum um, and, and it takes longer and more effort for you to recover. And if we can help people be more on the side of fitness or build up this resilience, then we are more resilient against those things that are just inevitable in life that we're going to encounter. So I think that's a beautiful illustration of what you're just talking about. I, I totally agree. I mean, the way it's usually set up is you start out when you're younger with a full tank of gas and you just kind of burn it over the course of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, and what do we do to actually enhance health rather than just act on sickness? Uh, almost nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just put as, as kind of a note here, a pin for maybe later. We, we see this as it relates to metabolic health most clearly. So looking at, for example, the development of overweight, you know, the United States, people are progressively, if not most people, overweight or obese. And you can see physically a manifestation of what's going on inside, which is metabolic dysfunction. So mm -hmm. the more extra weight you have specifically around your abdominal region, the higher your chances are of developing type two diabetes. You're 20 times more likely to get type two diabetes. If your BMI is over 35, the correlation is very good. So we can see this stuff from the outside. We can say, okay, so as I'm gaining this extra weight, I am at higher risk of health conditions. But what we do not see, which I would argue is maybe even more important, is 
we don't pay attention to mental health issues until all of a sudden it's bad enough that you require a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And this is almost a universal failure in that even doctors like me in training are basically told there's nothing that you really need to do until a person is diagnosed with depression. And until you as a doctor are experiencing such extreme symptoms that you go in and seek psychiatric help. Mm -hmm. So this, this is a huge miss because if you think about all the things that we do that relate to health or don't our decision to go to the gym on a given day, that is a direct manifestation of mental health. And we have this nonsense society where the only situation where it makes any sense to do preventive mental health counseling is basically for the very few people who, you know, either can afford it or who have broken through to decide this is a priority. By and large, for the average person, the only time that mental health is something focused on is when things are bad enough that it's an extreme instance that they either need to seek medical care or it's having a huge impact on their day-to-day -day function. So we're starting to get this idea of you need to do things each day to prevent, let's say, heart disease. There was a huge push decades ago. It still continues that you got to go out and, and run. You know, you have to do your 5K or whatever because it lowers your risk of having heart disease. And that's great in that we're talking about doing something proactively decades before you get an outcome, in this case, let's say a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Where is that conversation for mental health? Where are people saying, if you're feeling good right now, that's the best time to take steps to continue feeling good. It's basically, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. Oh my gosh, you need to go and see a psychiatrist. And that just is not a sustainable plan. I think that is so true. And such an example, like I just think about in primary care, we generally are giving people questionnaires to screen for, you know, do you meet criteria for depression or anxiety? And that's how, when we start talking about it, if someone screens positive versus, you know, and same thing with diabetes, like is your hemoglobin A1C in a pre-diabetic or diabetic range? Okay. Now let's start doing something about it versus, you know, being more proactive. And I think people are generally more accepting of being proactive about nutrition and exercise, but mental health is not something that, that is often approached in the same way. So, you know, I love that you, that you just brought that up and maybe that sort of relates to this concept of stuckness that you talk about. Can you explain what you mean by that? And how did you come to be so interested in it? I think we all have kind of our frameworks, our philosophies on explaining life. You know, we, we have these ideas, these overarching themes that can help us to put things into buckets. But the one that really has resonated for me is this idea of kind of stuckness, because I think it it goes through all the different levels at which I try to understand, um, you know, where we are as humans, our health as humans. So it goes through psychologically, it goes through biologically, it goes through at a cellular level. Um, and so just to kind of give an example of that, if you look at the states, the kind of disease states that are most problematic today, um, you could go through, kind of run through the top killers of people around the world. These tend to be kind of cardiometabolic diseases. Um, some of the things that we've already mentioned, so stroke and heart attack, but also diabetes, also uh, conditions like Alzheimer's disease. Uh, if you were to think about what are kind of the major disease buckets for psychological states, it would be depression, anxiety, stress. And what these conditions in many ways represent is that our biology has kind of gotten stuck into certain patterns, more rigid patterns that in these cases are linked to disease. Mm -hmm. um, metabolic dysfunction is a great example of this. So what happens in metabolic dysfunction is you progressively build up insulin resistance uh, an insensitivity to insulin, which makes it harder to get rid of excess glucose. And things actually do become physically more stuck, more <laughs> rigid as a result of that glycation that happens with the glucose floating around. But in essence, your body moves more and more towards a state of this metabolic inflexibility, stuckness. Um, we see similar changes with these brain-related conditions. So we now understand that in people with mental health conditions, you can start to see patterns in how their brains fire where they, in essence, get stuck in these unhealthy thoughts and actions that correlate with visible brain states when you look on something like a functional MRI. So the, the bigger kind of theme here is as we look at the opportunities to have the type of health that I would argue we all kind of want, 
they are largely a representation of identifying where we're getting stuck and finding ways to get that stuckness out of our thinking, of our action patterns. And that stuckness has a very concrete biological basis. So if we're thinking about things in a pattern that's unhealthy for us, which you could say, let's say anxiety is getting stuck in the future, depression is getting stuck in the past, stress is somewhere in between where you're in essence just worried about things that may or may not happen. Um, those are correlates of patterns of stuckness in our brain biology. And maybe the most interesting thing about all of this is science has now shown us what some of those pathways are. So whether it's the immune system, whether it's, it's our metabolism, uh, things like neuroplasticity, hormonal regulation, neurotropins like brain drive, neurotrophic factor. I know this is kind of a, a big bucket I'm giving, but the point is that there's all these different levels in which we can understand how stuckness permeates through our biology. And that by doing that, we actually gain the tools necessary to unlock some of those things and regain really the key, which as you mentioned, kind of resilience is the goal. And resilience is a function of flexibility, the ability to handle new things that you know we didn't necessarily plan for, but we have that wiggle room where we can be flexible, think new ways, behave in new ways, and manage these new problems which are inevitable in life. Love that. And in the way that you described too, the impact or the role that the brain plays in that, because at the end of the day, you know, the brain, the neurological system is the way that we take all of our information in the way that we process it and the way that we then, you know, act or have um, any, any behaviors. And so if that part is stuck, it makes it really hard to, you know, change anything physically or to, to change any of the behaviors that can affect your physical health. That's, that's right. Um, I'll just tell people, you know, I'm sure you have lots of guests on here telling you, here's what you need to work on today. And all of those things are true, right? So, I'm a big fan of, let's say, doing uh, higher weight, lower body exercises because you have large muscle groups that are going to help you improve your immune function, bring in excess glucose. All of that is true. But if you really think about why those things matter, it's because at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is quality of life, is mental health, is brain health. And I'll say that again, the only variable that's really in a primary outcome is your enjoyment of your life experience. And while all the other things matter too, you know, your dexterity, uh, whether or not you have pain when you're walking, your uh, strength on a certain exercise, your, your 5K time, these are all surrogates for the only thing that matters, which is your brain health. So if you're thinking about things that kind of get you directly to the outcome of interest, which is the ability to enjoy life, a reflection of your brain state, then you can start to think about what are the highest yield activities that are going to act directly on that system. And coming back to kind of what I said before about we don't think about mental health until things go wrong. Most people don't think about their brain health until things go wrong. And this is mm -hmm. at the extreme ends of the spectrum. There are people who basically don't consider how is my brain health today until they start getting worried about developing dementia or until somebody in their family develops dementia. You know, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's disease affects tens of millions of people around the world. That number is expected to go up to around 150 million by 2050. It's, it's an absurd number of people that are experiencing this. But even the crazier thing is that most people do not worry about whether that's even a possibility until it's upon them. So the point I'm making here is we ignore brain health at our peril even though that is actually the thing that all of us at the end of the day care about. And it's the thing that drives our decision-making in a given day. If you think about why do I do something versus something else? It's because in theory, you're trying to do what feels best for your brain. I think that so many of our actions, whether it's, you know, spending hours kind of binging social media, watching TV shows, we don't care about eating unhealthy foods, engaging in unhealthy relationships. We do this to try to get our brain state to a place that feels better, that is less stressful, that allows us to kind of forget about something else that happened, that takes away pain that came from something else. But we're not actively thinking about, well, these actions are designed for that specific outcome. It's only when you peel back the layers here or, you know, go behind the curtain and say, actually, what am I doing as a reflection of what brain state am I trying to get that you're able to get some insight into it? And I think it's really important for people to know that the baseline or the kind of 
average setup is that for most people, their brain state will be largely directed by the prevailing winds, by whatever's nearby. So one example of this is average American is spending around 11 hours a day engaging with digital content, two plus hours a day on social media, four plus hours a day uh, watching TV. All of those inputs are actively changing your brain state. And so I just don't think people are asking themselves, you know, you might care about what you're eating because you know that eating certain food, certain foods are better for your microbiome or eating certain foods are better for how you feel. But are you asking, how is the TV, the media I'm consuming good for or bad for my brain, since that's the actual thing I care about most? We're not asking the question. So we're kind of deferring those answers to whatever is around us. And for most people, what's around us is pretty unhealthy. (laughs) <laughs> That's a great point. It reminds I was laughing because it reminds me of what my mom used to say when I was in high school and watching garbage TV shows. And she says, don't don't put that stuff in your brain. But she was onto something. Um, so I think that um, and I think the point that you made about how at the end of the day, our brain health is really all that matters is a great point. I think that even if you were to ask yourself, if I had the perfect fitness. I was able to do everything I wanted to physically. I had, I looked the way I wanted to look, you know, I slept eight hours a night. I, you know, did all the things right, but I was still feeling anxious or unhappy or depressed. Then, you know, what kind of life is that, right? If you're not really experiencing joy and connection and happiness. And so I think thinking about it that way is really helpful for people because we can also become very obsessed over these health behaviors and that can create more anxiety too. Yeah, Um, you're you're right. I I think just to your point, you say that everyone has the things that are important to them. mm -hmm. And if you ask why and just keep asking why, you'll eventually get to because it makes me feel good or some version of that. And that is basically getting to the, the central point here, which is your brain is in a state that you enjoy. That's it. So if you can ask, well, what else can I do to get there? Then all the other things are still relevant, but they're not necessarily, they can become a little more interchangeable, I guess is what I would say, is it doesn't have to be doing this exact thing in this exact way. Once you start to understand what it is that makes my brain feel good. Um, I think that's also, it helps you to understand how when you do things that initially feel pleasurable, but long-term leads you to feeling crummy, you're able to to question that a little bit more because you start to get some perspective on, well, do I want to pursue pleasure or brain satisfaction or kind of long-term meaning purpose, those types of things. And I like your approach. I think that you, it seems like you really advocate for doing things in moderation in a, in a very, um, you know, in a way that serves that brain health or serves that, that like greater purpose or what you are, um, you know, what you really care about most. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. It doesn't have to be, you know, a very prescriptive plan for every single person. Yeah. I mean, I will say, uh, because of the way that life is set up these days, uh, with social media, TV, magazines, news being what it is, everything is kind of designed towards you need to have a very specific and narrow pitch to compete Uh, in the realm of health influencers. I guess the most common topics uh, are usually around nutrition, the food that you eat. And because of the way things are set up, it's the more extreme voices that rise to the surface. And so what you're going to see and what probably many listeners have seen is people out there saying you've got to be paleo, carnivore, keto, vegan, uh, pescatarian, South Beach, Atkins, whatever. And that's just absolute. You know, that's what the science has shown. It is what it is. And I've got a lot of problems with these types of claims. And, you know, it it goes beyond that. There's some people who say, oh, well, it's celery juice that's going to solve all your problems. That, That is literally a thing. And I don't mean to take anything away from people um, as far as, you know, for some people that may resonate. But I think we do need to understand that as it relates to the things that are most statistically studied to benefit the average person's brain health, it's almost always the kind of middle ground. It's a balanced approach done over many years. Yeah, I think it's very similar to investing in the stock market. So some person might have put $100 into pick your cryptocurrency or stock and gotten really wealthy. 
That does not mean that for the average person that makes any sense at all. But that's the way that our nutrition education goes. It's pick a random person. They lost 50 pounds, maybe because they were doing this diet or maybe because they were taking a bunch of supplements or maybe because they were exercising like a mad person. Mm -hmm. uh, that anecdote is not evidence that the average person will experience anything near that benefit. But there's almost no incentive for people who are trying to make it big on these outward facing platforms to be, you know, banging the drum of it's a balanced diet, maybe with some plants and also maybe with some animal products that has been most consistently studied to be linked to good overall health. Uh, and I will just say, as it relates to brain health, there's, there's really two diets that are the most consistently studied to benefit brain health. It's the Mediterranean diet and it's mm -hmm. to a smaller degree, the mind diet. And both of those are dietary patterns that emphasize not eating highly processed foods, not eating added sugars, uh, eating plants, eating some animal products, but in these cases, less red meat, more things like fish. But we're not talking extremes here where, you know, the Mediterranean diet doesn't say you have to drink a gallon of olive oil each day. That's not the core of it. It's saying mm -hmm. olive oil can be part of this diet. And so I guess kind of the main takeaway with this is there is so much, uh, sensationalism as it relates to everything health related these days. It's your doctor hates you and only this alternative medicine doctor is going to help you. Or it's the, these diets are terrible and you need to eat more of this, you know, I don't know, some rare spice that's found in the Andes mountains. It's, it's really hard to see through it all because it's so prevalent. But mm -hmm. the point is that as we're looking at the things that are most studied to benefit our overall and especially our brain health, it's doing the boring stuff the basics, consistently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes hard to get across. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen to that. Amen to that. So you've talked a bit about you know nutrition and just media, you know, screens social media, things like that, that are influencing us. But, but what is it about our environment today that is, that is influencing us to get so stuck? And then how can we help to mitigate those factors? Yeah. Well, here again, there's going to be a scenario where I wish I could just tell you it was one thing. I wish I could say, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the added sugar. And if you stop drinking soda, your problems will go away. Or mm -hmm. I wish I could say it's, it's social media. If you turn off your phone, your problems will go away. Um, is it those things? Yes. And right. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the challenge. So the two things I would say are first, many things contribute to our epidemic of stuckness. And on the other hand, I'd say many things can help us to get out of that. Mm -hmm. So there isn't one driver and there isn't one solution. I think that's super important. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the drivers. So when my dad and I wrote the book brainwash, we talk about this thing called disconnection syndrome. We talk about mm -hmm. these things that are in essence funneling us into this state of stuckness. Um, there, there are some of these things we've already talked about. So diet is terrible. I mean, we can talk about that at length, but <laughs> sure. the, the basics there are that we're eating a diet that has been highly processed where the key nutrients have been taken away and where junk has been added in uh, best example being added sugars, which are in 70 plus percent of foods and beverages. Um, so diet is bad and really our ultra processed life can just be kind of generalized to everything else. So our ultra processed life means we don't spend time outside. We spend our time in front of screens. It means that we spend time in front of screens instead of going to sleep. It means we've cut out our normal sleep weight cycle because we are getting exposed to light late in the day. Um, so instead of getting the seven to nine hours of sleep we need, most people are getting between six to seven, but often on the lower end of that spectrum, that is a disaster for overall health, metabolic health, immune health, brain health. Um, other things, obviously movement. I mean, something that your audience, I'm sure very well knows, and we can harp on this all we want, but as it pertains to the interventions that are most associated with getting our brains unstuck by way of biochemical changes, specifically by augmenting neuroplasticity and potentially even the ability to increase growth of new neurons, exercise is at the top of the list. And so we are, as everyone knows, incredibly sedentary where we spend the majority of our days seated. Mm -hmm. um, so that leads to a whole host of biochemical pathways that get us stuck. Um, 
couple other things to note. One of those is that if you look at the strongest correlation between kind of overall life satisfaction and any sort of health variable, it's meaningful relationships. Mm -hmm. And it is very clear, the signal is very clear that we are increasingly lonely. Um, This has been a signal that existed prior to the pandemic, but has only been exacerbated by said pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got a lot of quote friends on our social media accounts, but it's meaningful, close relationships that seem to be key. And so I think that our movement towards kind of a me first culture uh, and away from a community based culture is definitely not helping anything. Um, The last thing I guess I'll just say here is the lack of mindfulness Uh, kind of a broad topic, but the way I would describe this is mindfulness is the idea of paying attention to the present moment rather than allowing your brain to either be sucked into the past, drawn into the future, or basically just put on autopilot. And so sucked into the past is, you know, ruminating on things that could have been uh, sucked into the future is anxiety and stress about what could happen. But in the middle is where I think we're really losing ourselves, which is basically just outsourcing our brains to our screens. And there's a lot of conversation as to is social media good or bad. I'd say the main signal I picked up on is for younger women and girls. That's who seem to have the biggest problem from a mental health perspective. But if you just think about you get X number of hours in the day. So let's say 16, 18 hours in a day that you're not sleeping. Mm -hmm. If we're spending 11 of those hours interacting with digital tech and two, three of those hours on our social media, on our phones, for those hours watching TV, you are outsourcing a lot of your inputs to whatever is out there. And by and large, it's just, it's not even that it's bad. It's just autopilot. Like Mm -hmm. you're not getting anything from it. It's there maybe isn't some sort of a, a crazy mental health outcome because you watch four hours of Netflix, but you're also not out interacting with the world, having meaningful connections, getting out into nature, prepping meals. So I think that mindlessness is a major driver, even if it's not this whole thing about, you know, you need to be meditating every day. You need to be doing uh, breath work and cold plunges. It's simply the opportunity cost that comes from spending so many hours of our day on autopilot that I think is a major driver. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the big contributors to our state of stuckness. Uh, We can get to, if you want to, some of the solutions, but the, the main thing I would want for people to understand from all of this is If you can just appreciate how many drivers there are that are in essence conspiring to keep you stuck, there's Mm -hmm. a a very big power that comes from being aware of this. So to understand that in a given day, everything is set up for you to fail and realizing that just knowing that will allow you to start making changes to say, you know, I'm not going to spend two hours a day doing this because I'm aware that it's not good for me or one of my personal favorites, if you're trying to pay attention for eating healthier food, just starting with reading the labels. And if it has the added sugar, say, I'm not doing this because I don't want to get progressively stuck. And that is the outcome that stems from not paying attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And just the point about awareness is so big. This, it is a little bit scary to think about how unaware we can be or how we can get sucked into these, like you said, the the social media or the TV where we're just not aware of the impact that's having on us overall. But then we start to feel it and we're like, something doesn't feel right, or I'm getting sick and I don't really know why. Um, And then also the, the opportunity then to, to realize that we can change our thoughts. We can change our brain patterns. So maybe being aware and saying, gosh, I don't want to eat this sugar, but well, I just always eat the sugar. So I'm going to keep doing it and being able to, to bring some awareness and shift you know, your state to be able to make those healthier decisions. Um, And I also loved how you brought up the the meaningful connections. I think, you know, referring back to what we had talked about earlier about your brain health is, you know, the most important. So much of that brain health does come from our heart health, our emotional health, our ability to connect with other people um, and, and experience emotions like love and joy. And so I love that, that you brought that up as well and emphasizing that for, for brain and how they, how they really, interact together. Totally. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the solutions. So how can we get unstuck? How can we fight against all these forces that are conspiring against us? Definitely. So here again, uh, I will say there's no one thing. 
And honestly, anybody who tells you there's one thing that's going to fix everything is creating more problems. Like, especially if it's tethered to a sale, which it almost always is. It's this diet, this book, this product, it's going to solve everything. So I try to focus on things that are based on evidence-based research and free and readily accessible. There's a number of things that don't necessarily hit those criteria. So, you know, there may be certain interventions that are expensive that are only available to certain people. For example, it's probably great to go on a three-week wellness retreat in, I don't know, Costa Rica. Not everyone can do that. So that's not Mm -hmm. super high on my list. It doesn't hit my core criteria. But what are the things that do? So there there are two that I tend to harp on kind of religiously. And those two are sleep and habit formation. And the reason for that is because they both hit all those criteria. Let's start with sleep. Uh, What's really nice about sleep compared to even exercise and changing diet is that people like getting sleep. People don't like not eating sugar. People don't like going to the gym for two hours, at least not everyone, and Mm -hmm. certainly not people starting their health journey. But people like the way they feel when they get adequate sleep. So that is part of the piece. Part of it is it's free. And part of it is that it's actually the most powerful kind of intervention you can make to improve your brain function uh, in a short time frame. When we look at things that correlate with brain function, for example, changing diet, for example, exercise, there are some signals for short-term brain benefits. Um, we can talk about those as it relates to exercise. But when we look at things that kind of have a, a global effect on improving brain function, sleep is top of the list. So sleep seems to have kind of this uh, large scale effect on regulating neuroplasticity, which I realized I should have defined earlier. Neuroplasticity is your brain's biological ability to change as a reflection of your environment. It's the driver behind memory. It's the driver behind your brain's ability to experience things differently on a given day. So really important. Sleep seems to regulate neuroplasticity. It especially seems to be key for memory. So if you take people and have them uh, either stay awake or take a nap and try to remember something, people who take the nap tend to have significantly better memory. But also sleep appears to help regulate emotional centers in the brain. Um, Beyond that, getting better sleep linked to better focus, attention, decision-making. So all of that is to say that I think for most people, the single best way to improve their brain health in a short period of time is to grant yourself a seven to nine hour window of high quality sleep tonight. And I do want to be careful here in saying that isn't to say that unless you get that seven to nine hours, you might not even want to try. It's to say, give yourself the sleep opportunity. That is the first step. It's not to say that you get in bed and your aura ring tells you you had X number of minutes of deep sleep. It's saying, just get in bed at that time, eliminate all potential distractions and see how things go. Now, I would just throw out a couple of tips to improve the chances that once you're in bed, you will get that high quality sleep. So just a couple of things to run through here. First is to try to make your room as dark and quiet and cool as possible. So dark is important because sleep throws off your body's circadian rhythms, makes it less likely that you produce melatonin, feel sleepy. Uh, Quiet is important because noise significantly disrupts sleep architecture, especially in the second half of the night. It's an Mm -hmm. interesting kind of tidbit here, but we have a sleep pressure that builds up over the course of the day. After we start sleeping, it starts coming down. So you'll be a lighter sleeper, relatively speaking, in the second half of the night and more likely to wake up if you hear a noise. Uh, And then the third part of this was the temperature. So this is an interesting thing that we now know that having a temperature, a core body temperature a little lower seems to be promoting sleep. And one of the ways that you can do that is simply to lower the temperature in your room to somewhere in the 60s, so 65, 66 Fahrenheit. Other easy ways to do this is actually take a shower or bath before bed, because even though it's warm, the evaporative healing or the evaporative uh, cooling can uh, help to bring your core temperature down and help you to get to sleep. So make your room a sleep sanctuary. And then just a couple of other steps on that. Don't drink caffeine after 2 p.m. For most people, you might consider noon. You might even consider earlier. Caffeine has a six hour half life. So drinking caffeine in the evening is a bad plan, even if you feel like you can fall asleep. 
It's mm-hmm. probably even worse for alcohol before bed. So if you are going to drink alcohol, try not to do it immediately before bed. The nightcap is a bad idea. Uh, and then just more generally, try to set up the hours before bed to be a wind down, which means limiting exposure to digital devices and especially stress inducing in basically stress inducing interactions in the hours mm-hmm. before bed. Just a couple of steps there. Last thing I have to say, if you are somebody who struggled with sleep for a long time and you've tried these things, it doesn't work. Or you've been told you snore, if you maybe have a big neck, if you maybe carry extra body weight, if you've been told you wake up in the middle of the night gasping for air, if you feel sleepy all day, talk to your practitioner about being evaluated for a sleep disorder. It's mm-hmm. It saves so many lives. Just ask them, could I have sleep apnea? Do I need a sleep study? It's really a worthwhile test. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's sleep. And don't be scared away by the CPAP. I think so many people are afraid of the CPAP, so they don't even want to ask or get a sleep study, but there's so many you know, advancements there and so many other potential tools. So. Absolutely. So this is both of us saying, if you have a sleep issue and (laughs) it's not getting better, ask your practitioner, should I be evaluated with a sleep study? It is a life-changing maneuver. Highly recommend. Uh, So that's sleep. Again, it's, it's free, it's accessible, it's powerful, and it has short-term benefits to brain health. Uh, I really can't recommend it enough. I mean, I know it's not some sort of powerful new uh, supplement that you have to buy online, but Mm -hmm. it is statistically speaking, so much more consistently valuable for the average person than anything you can buy on Amazon. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's one. Absolutely. I love it. (laughs) Okay. Uh, The other thing I tell people to focus on is habits. And so we've kind of seen a, uh, an influx of people being interested in habits because you have books like James Clear's uh, Atomic Habits. Uh, We recently had Tiny Habits by BJ Fogg. Um, We have Good Habits, Bad Habits by Wendy Wood. There's a lot of focus on this idea of habits. A lot of people have been employing these things for the betterment of their health. What I would tell people though is the piece that we tend to ignore as it relates to ways to improve your decision-making which is super important. Your decision-making is what leads you to either pick up a piece of uh, a vegetable or the Oreo. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's what either gets you to put your shoes on and walk out the door and go to the gym or settle in on the couch as your decision-making. We don't think about the fact that upward of 40% of our decisions are subconscious, unconscious, automatic. They are habits, which means that we are basing why we make a good or bad decision on a singular variable of basically willpower, as long as you know what is healthy. Um, In the medical sphere, I think we largely still operate under this assumption that if we tell people that, for example, fast food is bad for them, they'll stop eating fast food. I don't think there is a single person in the United States over the age of 18 to 21 who's out there like, you know what? I really believe that Wendy's and McDonald's and Burger King is good for me because based on the available evidence, that's what seems right. People know that. Similarly, I don't think there's a lot of people out there saying, you know, I think we need to exercise less. I think that what's killing us, what's making us unhealthy is that we're going to the gym or going on jogs or going for Mm -hmm. hikes in the woods. So the, the point being here, it's not just about the information, it's the follow through, but the variable we keep coming up to is you gotta have enough willpower. And willpower has a biological basis, but is only part of the puzzle as to why we do or don't make a good choice. And another big part of that is habit. So with all that as preamble, habits are these automatic loops that occur when we do the same thing repeatedly in the same context. So you can't necessarily say, I want to have uh, a habit for taking a math test and doing really well on it. It requires it to be something that is relatively low cognitive impact. So a better example would be most people probably brush their teeth at least once a day. And if Mm -hmm. you don't, you probably should. Uh, So so much (laughs) value. You heard it here. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But when when you brush your teeth, you're probably not having to think, okay, so bottom right back molar gets 23 brushes and then bottom or top right incisor is getting 22 brushes. You don't have to do this because you've done it enough that your brain says, Mm -hmm. we'll put this on autopilot. And instead, if you're like most people and probably like me, your brain's going to go on some random, you know, side quest to think (laughs) about uh, that appointment you have tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. or the email you just answered. Mm -hmm. So the point here is our brains can multitask, but they can't consciously multitask very well. And the way they do that 
is by outsourcing information from our conscious parts of the brain, the prefrontal cortex and the cortex in general, to the basal ganglia, these more unconscious, more primitive parts of our brain. This is really, really important because if you are outsourcing these unconscious parts of your brain uh, and having them do unhealthy things, then you basically hired a worker who's just always going to be messing you up. Like Mm -hmm. they're not going to do your papers right. You're going to get audited because your taxes are going to be messed up. They're not going to follow up with your contacts. You basically just hired someone that's going to ruin your company. So we don't think about that. We don't think about this question of what am I outsourcing to this unconscious part of my brain? Habits, again, are formed when we do the same thing repeatedly in the same context, provided they're relatively low cognitive strain. Mm -hmm. So examples of how this gets to be a problem is we think about, for example, that if you are eating unhealthy food every day, you say, well, I don't want to be eating those cookies every day. So you think, well, I just have to force myself to stop eating the cookies. If you were going to take a habit-based approach to this, you might say, what are the series of steps that lead to me eating the cookies? You get home from work. When you walk in the door, you put down your bag, you open up the cabinet, take out the cookies and sit on the couch and watch TV. That is the series of steps that happen. The habit in your brain may very well be that when you open the door to your house, then that is the trigger to open the cabinet for the cookies, sit down and eat the cookies. So it's really not at some point about the pleasure you get from eating the cookies. It's basically your brain's autopilot says, this is what's going to happen every Mm -hmm. single day. So the deconstructed way, and I highly recommend these books that I already uh, recommended, is to, to, to understand the cue and the routine that leads to the outcome, the habit. Um, because very often we do unhealthy things, not because they bring us much pleasure, but because we've done them so many times that our automatic brain is just taking over. Um, so there's, there's a lot to discuss beyond that, but the point being understand that many of the things that you do are happening because they're automatic, they're unconscious. They're not even something that you're actively choosing. And if that's something healthy, then great. And if it's something unhealthy, there's a very clear series of steps that you can take to overwrite that habit with something healthier. But again, you have to kind of know how your brain works and what is necessary to overwrite it. So uh, for fear of just going on too long about this, check out one of those books. (laughs) They'll walk you through the exact steps necessary. That's great. You have to outsmart your own unconscious brain to to unwind some of those. Or just get it on your team. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Have it work for you instead of having to work against it. What, what are some other things? So sleep and habits are two that you start with. What are some other things that you recommend for people to get unstuck? Well, diet usually tends to be something that we can go into and then stay in for a while. So I'll just put my general kind of high level piece, which is eat the things people have messed with the least. I think that's a a good kind of overview of how to approach it. So Mm -hmm. don't eat an apple snack, eat an apple. Uh, Don't eat necessarily a whole bunch of kind of flavored meat snacks, eat a piece of actual meat if that's what you choose to do. The more Mm -hmm. steps between where that thing existed in nature and actually being consumed by you in general, the less healthy it is for you. The, The easiest way to kind of do this is if it has nutrition facts and and, uh, kind of an ingredients panel, try skipping it. Try Mm -hmm. to find something that does not need that, but also try to reduce your intake of things with added sugar. I think that's of all the things that happen with ultra processed foods. I think trans fats was up there very high for me for a while, but those have been phased out mostly. Mm -hmm. What hasn't is added sugars. And of all the kind of signals from the Many, many nutritional, epidemiological, and some interventional studies that we've seen, it's added sugars, specifically in the form of liquid, so sugar-sweetened beverages, energy drinks, coffee drinks, um, even juices that are probably most worth avoiding. So big picture is try to avoid anything that humans have messed with a lot, and kind of more nuanced is try to avoid added sugars. I think those are the the main steps, you know, without going into macros, micros, and Mm -hmm. polyphenols and stuff. Right. Um, coming back though, to my, my big thing, which is try to make it accessible, try to make Mm -hmm. it uh, cheap and try to make it effective. I think nature exposure is a really good one. Um, so we, we are pretty clear on this research showing that people who spend more time outside, uh, and I want to be clear, um, 
it doesn't necessarily mean you can't live inside, but meaning you intentionally go outside for the benefits of getting nature tend to have better health outcomes. Mm -hmm. Um, in the United States, at least about 93% of our time is spent indoors. And obviously Mm -hmm. that's a huge change from what our ancestors used or used to do. I'm not one of these people that says you need to go be a hunter gatherer again. I think it's not (laughs) practical. Um, but there are some real benefits that come from shutting down the computer, turning off your phone and just going outside in nature. And some of the more kind of uh, significant benefits as it relates to some of the recent research is that people tend to have anti-stress benefits when they spend time in nature. So there's a study that came out where they took people, sent them into either a natural setting or an urban setting within uh, basically a city. So they weren't necessarily going out to Yosemite or Yellowstone. They were basically just going into an urban park. And 20 minutes of that exposure was sufficient to lower their salivary cortisol levels, which I think is awesome. Mm-hmm. There's some some more interesting stuff. So one of the studies I like, they sent some adolescents out into the woods. They had another group stay in the city. And then after a few days, they had them gauge their ability to kind of interpret people's emotional state based on facial expressions. The okay. nature group did better. So... There's, there's one other group of studies I'd just like to bring up. If you're somebody who's trying to optimize your brain function, there's something called attention restoration theory, which is, uh, it's a really interesting idea that states that if we give our brains a break by looking at something that's more of a natural field, then it actually mm-hmm. resets our focus and resets our attention. And they've done this by looking at how people's decision-making happens uh, when they are even exposed to short amounts of virtual nature which is, you know, that's not my recommendation. My recommendation is actually go get outside, but um, sure. people will actually improve focus. And maybe what's even more interesting is that people tend to make more future oriented decisions after exposure to even virtual natural environments. So there's something about exposure to nature as opposed to cityscapes that mm-hmm. seems to help our brains to reset and to kind of predispose our decision-making towards the future rather than just the present. Um, To that end, my general recommendation is that doctors should be giving a prescription for vitamin N. Uh, What does that look like? It doesn't have to be four hours a week. I think starting with something like 20 minutes a week is, you know, shown in science to have benefits. Um, But if you live somewhere that's not 100% feasible. I think indoor plants are a nice way to get some of those benefits. There's some research around those as potentially having uh, cognitive mental health benefits Mm -hmm. and and start with something like a snake plant, which I know isn't totally free, (laughs) but it's far less likely to die than some of the other plants that that I have around me right now. That might be a good one for me to start with then. I love that. So if you can get outside, get outside, but if not, maybe some plants or even like you said, even if even having a a landscape photo on your wall in your office that you can look at from time to time can actually have some benefit. That's that's really amazing. Also maps. Maps are really good. Oh, okay. <laughs> and globes. I'm just looking at your background. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Got it. Um, wonderful. Anything else that you want to share in terms of how we can best help support getting out of this state of suckness or or support general um, health and well-being? Well, I'm not the person on YouTube or whatever talking about getting out of the matrix and the red pill and all that other stuff. But I do think there's, there's something to that, which is the reality is that most people are unhealthy. And the reason for that is largely preventable. And yeah, I think there is kind of this, this, I don't know what we want to call it, this learned helplessness that comes from basically existing in this septic soup of the modern Mm -hmm. world where Mm -hmm. everyone around us is unhealthy. And so all of our inputs are unhealthy and we say, well, what is there to do? This is just, this is the way it is. And there may be a point in the future where that is true. Uh, It's a really, it's kind of sad thing to say, but as I see the rise of the GLP ones and drugs that may very well be kind of the default, um, there's a sadness within me with the understanding that, you know, even though we still have solutions that people either don't care enough or don't have access to those solutions. And so we're, we're going to be increasingly chasing the pharmaceutical solutions for things that could be done in, I guess, a more natural way. Um, Not to take away from the fact that some people benefit from those drugs. But what I would say is, 
we still live in a time in which you can reclaim some of your biological autonomy by making the changes that we described. And there's this huge trap, which is to basically jump on to the latest New Year's resolution diet, see maybe a little benefit and then fail, and then be even worse off than before you started, which is the sense of what's the point? Nothing I do is going to make a difference. I'll just do what's easiest, which is spend my day on my phone, eating unhealthy food, not exercising. And I think what's really important to, for people to understand is it is challenging to start getting into some of those healthier habits, healthier patterns of action, but it is anything but impossible. And the little things are going to be the most important for getting you from A to B. So as much as people want to talk about, look, it's the new year, I'm going to lose 30 pounds, I'm going to go to the gym every day, um, I'm going to sleep nine hours a night, what does work and will work is to make small changes, sustainable changes, and to build a community of people around yourself that normalize that. So it's not the people who are on the extremes of diet saying, look, look, here's me, look at how sexy I am on social media. It's people who are saying, I'm interested in making sure I get in, you know, some steps each day that we're going to try to get to the gym. We're going to try to reduce the added sugar in our diet and in essence, reject the status quo and build towards becoming a healthier uh, community. So for whatever this is worth, I mean, this is one of the things I talk about a lot. Like I'm on this journey as much as everyone else is. I exist in the same world. There's some things that I have access to that other people do not. There's some things that you know, I live in the Pacific Northwest. It's very dark for a lot of the year. And that's a real thing, uh, mm -hmm. both from a mental health perspective and like just my desire to go out and exercise and stuff. So I think it's, it's let's be honest that things are not good as it relates to the default. But let's also be honest that there are a lot of ways to get out of this if we just kind of be transparent about this stuff. If we stick to the science, which shows us there are solutions, they're not always the sexy solutions, but they are real and they do work. And basically to yeah, help to link community of people who are on board with this messaging and who are willing to share, like, here's what I'm trying right now. And here's how it is or isn't working. Mm -hmm. and I think it's, you know, it's very important for health people to say, I'm not perfect either. And this system has its flaws. Uh, but it's also just important for people to take a bit more agency into saying, you know, healthcare doesn't happen in the doctor's office, the majority of it, at least. Mm -hmm. And I've got to be the person who is most interested in my health. And so going back to what I said before, there are so many ways to start making these positive changes, getting a bit better sleep, creating some healthier habits, getting outside or a little bit of nature exposure. These are the things that will help you compound to get to a place where you're able to more consistently make good decisions. And it is so big of a recommendation for me that you do things that are sustainable rather than jump on the latest bandwagon. Because once you start failing at these things time and time again, you feel like it's you rather than basically you never had a scientific approach to doing this. The brain mm -hmm. doesn't change overnight because you really wanted to, or because you do something really extreme a few times, it changes because you do the same things repeatedly and you really create these new rewiring patterns. So mm -hmm. that, that's what we were talking about here today. You, you have these tools to help rewire your brain. It just requires some consistency. And so to that end, you know, we're here, we're trying to do it too, or I guess I'm not going to throw you into this as well. But. <laughs> oh, I'm on board. We're all doing it. And I think you articulated it so beautifully. And I share a lot of that sadness, but I think like the points that you just made are so important that, you know, we have, and in, in what we talked about before, that these unconscious parts of our brain can get hijacked so easily. And there are so many forces conspiring against us, whether it's the food industry and fast food on every corner or the sugar that's in all of our foods or, um, you know, technology um, or even pharmaceuticals trying to, trying to give you a quote unquote easier way out. And the only way that we're going to overcome this as a, you know, society is through community. Like you said, it's by, by making these changes, seeing what's possible, getting out of our own kind of story of what happens. Like many people, I think have the story of, well, well, this is what happened to my parents or my grandparents. Eventually you hit a certain age, then you have to be in a nursing home, then you have to be on medications and that's just how life goes, but it doesn't have to be that way. And we, you know, through 
connecting through sharing other stories, through sharing what's possible, through making these changes together in community. I think that's how we are going to overcome these things. Because like you said, you can't, you can't do it through willpower. It's definitely, um, the the forces are so strong. And so we have to take a, a different approach. Totally. And I'm on that journey with you. So <laughs> to wrap up, I this will segue great into some of your own journey, but three questions I ask everyone at the end of the podcast. The first one is, what are the three things that you do on a regular basis that have the biggest positive impact on your health? So number one is going to be sleep. That is mm-hmm. the quickest thing I see when I don't get sleep. Um, mm-hmm. I'm right I'm- there with you. It's not worth it. <laughs> I, th- these are not going to be super exciting. Number number two is food. I, so I think you, in a given day, you get so many variables that are within your control. Mm-hmm. If I lose one, uh, I can still make it. Once I lose two, it gets hairy. And if I lose three, I'm in a bad spot. And they're basically yeah. sleep, food, and exercise. Okay. So especially when traveling and things, usually I'll, I might lose one and maybe even two of those. Mm-hmm. If I lose all three, I feel my mental and physical health fall off very quickly. So mm-hmm. it's prioritizing sleep almost every day, trying to be consistent about it. It's not a hundred percent. Sometimes I'm out with friends and sometimes I don't get to bed sure. until late. That's okay. But it is a priority each day. Uh, the physical activity is I a hundred percent can tell, uh, when, if I, if I don't exercise for a few days, if I'm doing a lot of travel, uh, I start to feel that both mm-hmm. mentally and physically. And then the third was the food piece. So, um, I think I am a bit more extreme than what I recommend people do for food. As far as uh, my partner and I, we cook a lot. We do not go out too much, mostly because we just prefer the food that we make than what most mm-hmm. restaurants do. But it's Must really be a pretty good cook then. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't even think that. I think it's just more like pick some decent quality ingredients. Yeah. You, nail, you nail a couple of things that are consistent. We're mm-hmm. not doing, you know, crazy gourmet meals every gourmet, day, but, yeah. but the breakfasts are pretty good. Um, but, <laughs> but basically try to, as much as possible, know your ingredients in the food. Mm-hmm. And I think if you start there and say, what am I having for breakfast? Well, instead of cereal, I'm going to eat maybe some eggs, or if you don't eat eggs, maybe some vegetables, but at least you're aware of what's going into it. I think is super mm-hmm. important. Um, so yeah, those are, those are the three things. I mean, obviously interpersonal connections really important. And I try to find things that I'm, uh, is, are cognitively engaging, but, um, I'd say independent of where I am, those are the three things that are, are. I love that. What's one thing that you're working on or something, you know, would have a big impact, but it's hard for you to implement. Oh, that, that is a good question. Um, one of the things I'm working on right now is trying to build out a larger community of people. Um, so I'm a bit more geographically isolated than I used to be. Uh, mm-hmm. I live out here outside of Seattle and um, have a great cohort of friends from where I grew up in Florida, great cohort of friends from med school and residency, but it's been more challenging up here and trying to find ways to to do connection with people and trying to trying to get a better sense and parse out, you know, what do you, what do I need from that? I think sometimes mm-hmm. it can be challenging because you want to meet people who hit every sort of metric, right? You want health focused people who go to the gym, eat healthy food on the weekends or thinking about places to go hiking and uh, are also mindful and all the other stuff. And mm-hmm. I guess I'm, I'm still trying to do a better job of meeting people who meet specific, but not all of my needs. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, the, the people you spend your time with, like you said, have such an impact on your own behaviors and your own experience. So, yeah. And it's definitely harder as a, as an adult or post, you know, schooling and, and residency. What the last question is, what does a healthy life look like to you, Austin? What a great question. Uh, I, I thought for a while about what does health, what is health? And so from that, well, what does health fee look like? And what does a healthy life look like? I mean, I think it, it it's a life in which, I guess to use kind of like some math terms here, I look at area under the curve for brain health. Mm-hmm. And brain health is a little vague. So the ability to enjoy life, um, experience meaning and, and lasting satisfaction for as much of the time as you can. And from that, I would say, you know, this doesn't mean happiness. 
I, I, for a while I thought, oh, it's all about optimizing happiness. Mm -hmm. It's, it's meaning, uh, which necessitates sadness and necessitates the other side of the curve. So that's why I'm saying, if you think about it on a given day, you might have a good day. You might have a bad day. Uh, meaning is somewhere in between and needs the contrast. So that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Brain health, which is a reflection of the ability or, or leads to the meaning, the long-term satisfaction, and it's the area under the curve. So it's not a given day. It's as many days as possible, sure, but it's the total area. Um, and so that, I think that comes from the things we've already described, but mm -hmm. the piece of it that maybe we didn't touch on, but I am thinking about a lot more is that the pursuit of happiness doesn't make sense to me, at least. I think that's often a surrogate we go after. It's, I wanna feel good every day. And I don't think that's the goal. Just like it's not the goal to never experience stress. Mm -hmm. um, it's the goal to experience love and meaning and purpose. And that's that's a little bit outside the scope of the biology of what we've discussed, but I do mm -hmm. think it's it's related. That's beautiful. Well, how about that for a spur of the moment answer? I'm seeing the the graph in my mind now. And it's so true, right? If we were just every day, like we're not robots, right? We can't, if we were just perfectly happy with big smiles on our faces every day, that wouldn't necessarily be meaningful either. It's usually in the struggle and some of the hard times that helps to create the most meaning for us and creates, creates those, um, you know, big moments of joy or connection. So beautiful, beautiful note to end on. Thank you so much for spending time with me today, Austin. I'm excited to share this and excited to continue to follow what you do. I think, like you said, you're, um, such a great, voice in the the field of health and wellness and fitness. And I love how you are so real and so focused on these things that aren't necessarily sexy or trendy, but the things that have the biggest impact. So thank you for doing what you do. Appreciate that. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, please consider subscribing and giving it a five-star rating on iTunes. It really does help to get the word out to more people.